Well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to ACBC Queensland's Plant-Based Protein Markets in Asia panel discussion and webinar. I'd like to acknowledge in particular ACB's partner and co-host, K&L Gates, for assisting with this event, in particular to Brian Healy, partner at K&L Gates, and his team, including Lana Harvey. Thank you very much. Let me also thank our moderator, Tony Hunter, food futurist, who's personally driven this event, and to our distinguished international panel. We have Viola Chen hopefully shortly joining us. We're just having a few technical issues. Viola is Innovation Specialist from JFI Consultancy. Salome Naik, who's Head of Innovation from AI Palette. And Andrew Ive, who's Founder and Managing General Partner of Big Idea Ventures. Thank you for your commitment and interest to our international panel in joining ACBC across different time zones and sharing your expertise on this important topic. Let me also acknowledge you, our members and non-members, both here in person and online, for participating in this event and in some cases adapting to late notice, as we all do, to recent COVID-related restrictions. I look forward to hearing from our highly experienced speakers on their insights and experience regarding the growth trajectory that is plant-based protein markets in Asia. Over to Tony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, as Elizabeth says, you can see on the screen, I'm a food futurist. And the first question I usually get is, what is a food futurist? Well, what I do is I help companies understand how all the amazing new technologies in the food industry are going to affect them and how they can use that to gain a competitive advantage because that's what it's all about, gaining a competitive advantage. And of course, one of the key technologies that we're seeing in the food industry now is alternative proteins generally, right at the forefront of everything that's going on. Five years ago, plant-based meat, what's that? let alone cell-based meat, growing meat from cell samples from animals in huge fermenters. Who'd heard of that? As I say, one of the key um, trends that we're seeing at the moment, of course, is a plant-based trend. We're seeing it here. We hear all about the US and Europe and everything else, but we don't hear nearly enough about what's going on in our own backyard in the largest market of the world in Southeast Asia. And that's why we have this webinar today, this panel, to tell us about what's going on in Asia generally, but more specifically what's going on in the China market, if there's such a thing as the China market, which we'll hear from some of our panellists here today. So as um, Elizabeth said, we have a stellar expert panel here, people who really know their stuff in that region. And uh, what I'm going to do is going to ask each of our presenters basically just to say a few words about themselves and their company, and then what they think are the key insights for the Asia and the China market in particular. And uh, Slami, we might hand over to you first. Sure thing, Tony. Uh, thanks so much for having me. So uh, I am the head of innovation at AI Palette. We are a Singapore-based startup backed by the government of Singapore and Ag Funder. And what we really do at AI Palette is that we look at real-time data from across the entire food data landscape. So we look at uh, you know, consumer behavior online through social media and search. And then we also look at the products in market to help uh, companies in the food and beverage universe uh, spot early signals when it comes to innovation, right? Uh, so uh, with that said, the plant protein space is one that we've been really looking at very closely, very keenly, and we've seen it evolve over the past few years. Um, so essentially, plant protein is not necessarily new to the China market. So to make things interesting, what we've done today is that we've actually dug into some of the data to pull out some uh, insights. Uh, so if we can, uh, so that's what I'll be taking you through next. So essentially what makes our approach at AI Palette unique is that firstly, we look at data which is specific to food and beverages. Uh, and that's particularly important because the language that consumers use when they're talking about uh, the F&B um, universe is quite unique and quite uh, different. Um, 
the second aspect is that we uh, you know we've trained our algorithm to understand multiple non english languages so that really helps us you know capture insights from different markets and that's really what helps us work with our clients to spot trends as they emerge locally so some of the insights that i will share with you are those which are you know where we analyze data in the mandarin language based on sources which are popular in china and then finally we also have image analytics to you know add a contextual understanding because of course food is a very popular topic online and a lot of the messaging actually and a lot of the conversation happens through images so we do uh, analytics around that end as well what i'll do next is take you through some of the key takeaways in terms of the data that we are seeing in the china market so first thing what we see is that uh, and uh, this is you know we've just picked out a, a million data points over the last few years and what we've really seen is that the consumer engagement and interest in plant protein has really been growing and it's really picked up pace starting early 2019 that's when we've seen a lot of product uh, products being launched in the market and consumers really talking about uh, that and uh, what we do see is that as compared to all the other macro trends which are unfolding in the china market the plant protein trend is definitely it's showing a lot of growth and a lot of growing consumer interest however when we look at the data what we see is that you know there are uh, you can see these spikes in consumer engagement and that's very typical of a trend where a lot of the engagement and interest is still primarily driven by investment in the market so a lot of those spikes are coming from new products which are being launched in the market which consumers are essentially in the china market are trying out uh, primarily driven by novelty right uh, so what, but let's look at what are some of the other evaluation criteria which are sort of top of mind for the chinese consumer so firstly we see that uh, plant protein products are primarily appealing to consumers who are health conscious and when i say health conscious they are not only interested in the quantity of protein but they're also interested in the quality of protein as well so we also see you know conversations around uh, functional benefits like amino acids and minerals in addition to uh, top uh, you know engaging with the uh, the protein content on the other hand what we do see is that the chinese consumer is really looking for products which are which are natural which incorporate natural ingredients which don't have too many additives uh, especially because you know mock meat is uh, has been around in china for some time so plant protein plant based protein is not really new to the china market so what the chinese consumer is really looking for are products which are not overly processed and at the same time they're unwilling to compromise on the product experience so they're un unwilling to compromise on sensory attributes of the product such as taste or texture and they're also looking for price parity as well so those are really some of the, the drivers which are really an evaluation criteria which are really top of mind for the chinese consumer what i'll quickly take you through next if we can go to the next slide is essentially uh some of the product launches which have driven that spike in consumer engagement so of course there's been a flurry of activity and this uh, some of the products that we we'll talk about are not on, uh, just the tip of the iceberg if you will but what we're really seeing is that there is a localization across qsr and retail and the localization is happening in a few different ways firstly it's localization of formats to appeal to the the chinese consumers palate at the same time there's also localization of texture and taste and flavor as well so this is something that we've seen across the product launches which are uh, which are sort of happening in the space and while a lot of the local and international players first entered the market with partnerships through quick service restaurants like uh, kfc or uh you know a lot of the restaurant chains what we are now seeing is that there is a move uh, particularly in the among the global giants where they are launching a more holistic product portfolio which also incorporates ready to eat and ready to cook products as well and there is also a move from uh, you know while in the us in a market like the us a lot of the flagship products were beef based in china we see that there is a move towards more pork based products being launched as well 
Um, and lastly, I'll end with this point that, uh, you know, in terms of the, when we look at what the Chinese consumer is talking about, since mock meat is a product format which the Chinese consumer is very well versed with, uh, you know, the uh, soybean and soybean based products are really what is front and center. And uh, that is where the consumer, that is the ingredient which consumers most strongly associate with the plant based movement. And there is a little bit of increasing awareness of other plant based alternatives like products which are made out of pea or other uh, vegetables as well. So overall, what I'll, uh, I'll end with this, that, uh, you know, what we've really seen is that uh, what's going to be key for the, for the plant-based movement in China is to convince those novelty seekers to make plant protein products a more regular part of their diet. And we believe that localization is really an important part of that. Great. Thank you very much for that, Salome. Thanks for that great overview of what's going on in the China market. And we solved our technical problems, and we have Viola Chen from the Good Food Institute Consultancy with us. And uh, Viola, if you would just like to say um, a few words about um, GFIC and give us your key takeaways, what's happening in Asia and China in particular. Well, thank you, Tony. Okay, hi everyone. This is Viola. I'm the innovation specialist of the GFI consultancy, and we are specializing in promoting our protein in the China market. And first of all, I would like to give everyone a, a bit background about meat consumption in China. So uh, everyone knows, um, actually in 1992, China already overtook US and became the largest meat consumer in the world. Uh, and I would like to highlight uh, actually, pork is China's favorite meat, according to the meat consumption data, as everyone can see in the slide. It's about 20 to 24 kg per capita in 2019. And uh, it's actually um, uh, make up 70% of the overall meat consumption of the China consumers. And it's here I want to emphasize, although China is considered as one market, but there are significant differences among regions and cities. What I mean here, for example, like first tier, second tier and third tier cities, and also southern, northern part of China, they all have different dietary habits, different meat consumption habits. And of course, Hong Kong is a totally different market. So everyone knows uh, actually, in Hong Kong, uh, for plant-based meats, there are several brands already break into that market, but in China, uh, not yet. Okay, so, sorry, I'm, okay, yeah. So this is about the plant-based industry context. And here, I, I want to highlight again, like, uh, since everybody already know it, China has a very long and rich history of meat substitutes, and also about plant milks. So here, like, plant milks, actually, Chin Chinese consumers will not consider as a dairy substitute, but they will consider just something they consumed, like, during the daily, uh, uh, daily meal. And then I wonder, uh, there's two facts about abandoned plant-based meat ingredients, soy and pea, and also stereotype consumer perception. Because the long and rich history of meat substitute, so people, and what I'm talking about here is more about, about the mass, uh, mass audience, mass public. They associate like plant-based meat with uh, vegetarianism and Buddhism. And top two drivers of plant-based meat consumption here is very interesting because I want to highlight when Chinese people consume plant-based meat, the first two are health and weight loss. I, I know weight loss is something not really common, but it's, it's literally like in the uh, survey. And the less concern about sustainability and man animal welfare. And here, the major consideration, I think that it's very it's very necessary for Chinese people. The first, the top one is the food security, about labeling, about regulation. But uh, but the, uh, currently there is only one voluntary standard about plant-based meat in uh, like uh, in China. But there is no industry or mandatory uh, standard uh, so far, and the taste. 
definitely the taste is about color, smell, texture, mouthfeel, and also uh, since we mentioned about health is the top driver, so here health benefits is also one of the major consideration when Chinese consumers uh, purchase uh, plant-based meat. And uh, again, China is not just a market because they also process over 50% of soil protein acetates and uh, because soil protein acetate is one of the main ingredients for plant-based meats. Yep, and then, uh, yep. Uh, and here I want to talk about a little bit about plant-based industry snapshots. Uh, about categorizing pioneer international companies because this is um, everyone uh, really uh, curious about, and you would say um, beyond just you just obviously already present and develop early markets. Um, I know about large food companies because uh, there are quite a bit, uh, quite a few large food companies already in the market like multinationals, for example, Cargill, DuPont, Nestle, Unilever, uh, definitely Unilever is in the brand of uh, the vegetarian butcher, and the Chinese large food companies, WH Group, which is a, a meat processing group and a known food spring, uh, they are rolling out plant-based products and they are in quite, quite interested in uh, bringing more products into the uh, markets. And definitely a dozen uh, local startups, like um, uh, uh, quite a few names, like the high, uh, the highest uh, funded startup, uh, Starfield, and also other uh, star uh, startups. They are multiplying and expanding through like mainstream food service and the retail. And the retail here not we are uh, what I mean is also online retail, like. Um, third-party uh, platform like JD and also Timo and Alibaba. And it, here I, I have a data to support uh, uh, like the growth of the plant-based meat market. Uh, according to your monitor and the market size of plant-based meat in the Asia Pacific region was 163 million US dollar last year. And China accounts for um, more than 70% of the entire region, which was about 116 uh, US dollar million. So we believe in China, there's full potential for plant-based product to uh, grow. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is um, the background of China uh, plant-based market. Thank you very much for that, Paul. A very in interesting dive there into what's going on actually in the market itself and uh, the various channels that the products are, are going through. But of course, you know, when we look at the conventional meat industry and what's going on, that has been around for a long time. And there are tens, hundreds of billions of dollars invested in conventional meat at the moment. And if that's going to be matched, then investment is going to be a real key to the future of plant-based meats not just in China, but elsewhere in the world. And that's why we have Andrew Ive with us today. Andrew, if you can tell us a bit about how you see the investment space in Asia and in China in particular, that'd be great. Absolutely, thank you, Tony. I'm feeling a bit left out. I didn't realize I was allowed slides. So if anyone's expecting my picture to disappear and something much more entertaining and interesting to come up, you're going, unfortunately, you're, you're sorely uh, gonna be mistaken on, on that. So a couple, a couple of things uh, from an investment perspective, and I'll also, if, I, if, if it's possible, come back on some of the points made uh, so far by the two other speakers. Um, quick background, uh, Big Idea Ventures is an investment uh, fund. We're a, a venture capital company. Um, we have offices in Singapore focused on Asia, including China. Uh, in New York, focused on North America, and in Paris, focused on Europe, we invest globally across uh, alternative protein. We have 44 companies that we've uh, invested in, in China, in Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, um, across North America uh, and Europe and other places. So, I mean, we've, we've really we've you know we've really dug deep into this area and and know it very very well got some really good uh you know team members who find great great companies 
Um, a couple of things that I absolutely agree with in terms of the previous speakers, a couple of things that I'd like to sort of call out from an investment perspective. Um, firstly, that we've seen some great companies coming through um, in China. Um, we've invested in, in some of them in the plant-based space. Uh, example one would be Gen Meat, um, which has created a plant-based crayfish and plant-based pork. Uh, both of those products are doing incredibly well. They've got good distribution across restaurants. And they, uh, Gen Meat has been called um, the Beyond Meat uh, of China. Um, it's, it's doing very, very well. Um, we've also got a company called Karana, uh, which is doing plant-based uh, uh, bows and dumplings. Uh, they launched it in Singapore. They're launching it in uh, China very shortly, as well as uh, 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 Taiwan and other places. So really, you know, they're, they're bringing these products uh, to the Chinese market very, very quickly. Um, another company uh, that's worth mentioning is Future Foods, which is spelled P-H-U-T-U-R-E. Future is doing plant-based pork that you can make into various dishes so you can uh, you know it comes as a mince that you can make uh it looks like pork tastes like pork smells like pork it's really quite a quite a special uh product um so you know there are a number of companies um and uh, one more while i'm on it on the subject well me w-e-l-l me are doing plant-based uh yogurt and dairy products uh, that's a, a, a really interesting company as well. So we're seeing a lot of innovation coming through. Uh, the uh, consumer is, is appreciating the product. One thing we've seen in other parts of the world, so North America and Europe, is it's not health that's necessarily driving the purchase intent. Um, it's it's a, a kind of a, co a consciousness in terms of sustainability about the uh, environment, environmental impact of the traditional meat and the traditional uh, dairy industries and the younger population are gravitating towards trying these products and providing the entrepreneurs and the, and the companies bringing these products to market they are delivering on taste, on performance, on texture, on price then often the consumers will take these products and repeat purchase and bring them into their homes and into their diets. So it's really on the, uh, on the side of the entrepreneur to deliver a great product on a consistent basis. And when they do, they get repeat customers and they expand their, their kind of uh, uh, market share. So in, in, in China, I, I do understand that one of the key considerations for purchasing plant-based is to reduce cholesterol, to reduce fat in the older population. I think one of the challenges um, of, of plant-based foods in China is meat is an aspirational consumption um, in China. So people, uh, people would like to eat more meat, not less meat. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the challenge that in, uh, is, is that in other parts of the world, so North America, Europe, meat is not an aspirational product. Um, people are trying to actively reduce their consumption of meat, which means we're sort of fighting against what people are trying to consume uh, in, in China. Um, one thing that sort of helps that, that whole equation is, is one of the things that Viola mentioned, which is China is not one place, it's many places. You've got tier one cities, you've got tier two cities, you've got mainland China. And what we're seeing on the investment side is that tier one cities are, are prepared to experiment and try new innovation, new plant-based uh, foods. And if the foods are good, and if they deliver on the promise, then tier one cities are prepared, uh, the consumers in tier one cities are prepared to continue the consumption. And that's being driven, I would, I would suggest, by the younger population who are trying it because of the novelty value and because it's called cool to, to do so because we've got celebrities and sports people and athletes and others who are bringing these foods to them saying, look, this is a better thing. This, these are great tasting products. 
that are better for you and better for the planet than the products we used to consume. And the younger population are willing to, to try and, and continue to purchase. So that's not a health reason. That's an aspirational reason. And that's why tier one cities are driving this change um, in, in China. Um, one thing, I a couple of things I would briefly mention. Um, on the cell base side, Singapore recently deregulated cell based meat. What that means is that for the first time in our history, you can now not only make cell based meat, but also sell it and consume it. So now you can buy cell based chicken in Singapore. Uh, you can, you know, uh, order your order your cell based chicken from the restaurant. The grab will deliver your your product to your door and you can be eating your cell based chicken, you know, 30 minutes later tasting quite nice. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that the COVID challenge that we've experienced um, globally um, has caused some governments to consider the supply, the supply chain challenges of long term protein and food production. And I think the best solution to some of those challenges is cell based technology. In other words, being able to grow uh, cell based meats in, a, in an environment which requires far less land, far less water and uh, uh, no antibiotics to reduce disease. So I think from a government perspective, many governments around the world, and I hope including China, will be looking at cell based meat as a long term, uh, if not medium term solution to food security, to produce the kind of protein that uh, is necessary to feed the population. Um, and I think therefore we, we should see in the next, I would say three to five years, more investment and more innovation coming through, not so much on the plant-based side, but I hope on the cell-based side. Terrific. Thanks very much for that, Andrew. Um, just one question I've got here, I'll just throw it open to the, the panel. Um, what is the, the dominant channel in China in terms of the current products? Is it food service? Is it retail? And if you are a new entrant into the market, which channel would you choose to go into first? So just generally to, to, to the panel. I'll, I'll make someone answer this if someone doesn't volunteer. <laughs> Gaiola, come on. And, this, and, is, this, is, this is one for you. Okay, sure. Um, actually, based on our observation and also uh, what uh, what we talked with other companies, uh, mainly they will choose uh, food service for their first uh, like uh, distribution channel, as plant based meat is is not something new because people will compare with mock meat. So you love consumers to try plant based meat first in a food like food service channel instead of just through the products into the retail channel and per, you know purse with them to buy. So this is uh, the most popular distribution channel so far. But of course, after a company explore in the food service channel, they would love their products available in the retail channel and also some uh, e-commerce channels, as I mentioned about uh, JD and Alibaba. Yeah. Thanks, Bella. Um, Salome, you have anything else to add there to that, those thoughts? Uh, Right. So um, uh, I think I'll add a point or two. So essentially, um, I absolutely agree with uh, Viola that, uh, you know, uh, food service does tend to be the dominant channel. I think based on consumer conversations, what we've seen is that part of that is also because of the impact that uh, the actual preparation, the actual method of cooking, uh, the impact that it has on the overall product experience. So which is why a lot of these brands are, uh, you know, sort of, choosing to enter the China market via the food service space. Uh, and what we have seen is that, uh, you know, increasingly, particularly in the larger food multinationals, they are sort of diversifying their portfolio by also uh, adding, uh, you know, bringing the uh, plant-based meat options into the Chinese consumers' homes. So there is there are sort of increasing options 
uh, both on the ready to eat and the ready to cook front as well. So we see that there is increasingly a hybrid strategy, which a lot of brands are using where, yes, it's dominantly food service, but then in part, uh, they're expanding into retail as well. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so just moving on to the, again, I'm saying that we're going to need a lot of investment. Who is currently um, investing in the market at the moment? Is it primarily VCs, family companies, governments? An obvious one, I'm going to go back to you first on this one, Andrew. What, what are you seeing? Who's investing? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, so <laughs> uh, we, we, <laughs> we, uh, we raised a fund. Uh, we were the first um, to, to create a fund, uh, which is also um, an accelerator. So basically, we raised over $50 million dollars. Uh, to focus exclusively on alternative protein. So plant, and, and for those that, you know, are wondering what alternative protein actually breaks down into, um, it's plant-based meat, seafood, and dairy. It's fermentation-based meat, seafood, and dairy. And it's cell-based meat, seafood, and dairy. So three, three kind of main mechanisms of creating meat, seafood, and dairy. Um, and, and so we, we created a fund um, which includes an accelerator, and it's exclusively focused on uh, that, that category of alternative protein. The folks who gave us that money are a combination of um, eight to 10 global food corporates who believe that plant-based and cell-based and fermentation-based alternative protein is probably the most transformative or revolutionary um, change in the food industry in you know a century, and believe that it's going to be the most uh, uh, kind of transformative shift uh, and growth opportunity from a you know consumption production perspective um, in, in 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 that hundred years. So if you sit down with you know the CEO of Nestle or the, the chief executive officers of um, I would say the top ten food companies globally, and you ask them to list the top three areas of fo strategic focus for their entire organization, alternative protein will invariably be one of those three. Um, and and so we've got food corporates in our fund. We've got. Uh, Tomasuk, which is the investment arm of the Singaporean government. Um, they put in a significant amount. We've got family offices. Um, so, you know, significant wealth from family offices who are doing so either because of environmental concerns or animal welfare concerns, or purely and simply because they see it as one of the, the largest wealth creation opportunities uh, in decades. Um, you know, it could be just as pure, a pure an investment motive as of making money. But invariably, um, it's, it's, I would suggest most of the motives are environmental, animal welfare, and it, even the food corporates are involved because they want to be at the cutting edge of the transformation of the food industry. They don't want to sort of be on the back foot. And they see being a part of a fund which is involved in, in this transformation helps them to understand the, the tsunami of change that's coming in the food industry. Great. Thanks, Andrew. And I might uh, throw this one to Salami. Um, Salami, who's the, the major demographic or psychographic that's actually consuming these products? Is it one or is it spread across the whole range of demographics and psychographics? Right. Uh, so... Essentially, what we see is that there are a few uh, demographics, uh, and I completely agree with uh, Andrew on on this one. That um, you know, meat consumption is very um, aspirational in China. So, on one hand, we see that uh, there is uh, there are novelty seekers who are essentially uh, you know they see something new in the market and they want to try it out, uh, and uh, that, of course, is in part driven by the just the flurry of products which are getting launched in the market. On the other hand, we also see that, uh, you know, in the China market, there is an increasing association of plant-based meat with health. So the health conscious are also gravitating towards it, uh, towards these products. And they're looking for not just the, the quality of 
protein but they're also interested in they want products which are which don't have too many preservatives don't have too many additives so they're also you know eating clean is also part of the driver but i think it's just as important to understand who is uh, you know how china really differs from the rest of the world and who's not gravitating towards uh, the plant based movement right so on one hand we see that uh, as compared to the west where a lot of consumers are uh you know consuming plant based products because of the impact on the on the planet and uh, because of sustainability concerns um that is uh, not necessarily one of the top of mind drivers uh, at least at this point of time in the in the china market and on the other hand uh, we also see that uh, you know uh, uh, typically in in the western uh, economies while uh, you know specific diet constraints like veganism for instance tends to be quite a big driver um, the veganism movement is still in a pretty dormant stage in china so essentially consumers are not necessarily looking for binary products they're actually really open to trying hybrids um, so they're you know because veganism is still in a very dormant stage based on the data that we've analyzed so uh, that's what i would add on that Okay. Thanks very much, Salami. And I'll just say to those who are viewing us online, um, you have got a Q and A. If you'd like to put any questions in the Q and A, we'll be taking a few questions from online and from the floor in a few minutes. So I might just finish off on this last um, question, which I think has come up a few times for all three of our panelists, which is how important in the China market is localizing your product for specific geographies. Tier cities or whatever. So, who would like to take that one first? I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. Can I? If can I? I'll be a super brief so that perhaps we can get some other opinions in as well. But um, I'm very. I've, I've been kind of. I mean, I love the fact that beyond an impossible of sort of a globally changing people's minds about meat. I, I love that they. managed to cross the chasm between the kind of dusty somewhat sort of esoteric asp uh, side you know the corners the corners of the supermarket and somehow managed to get get this sort of plant based product It used to be the kind of tofu and the you know really kind of stinky unpleasant parts of plant based and they've managed to make it mainstream and they managed to put plant based food and and so on in the meat category i just love what they've done but um i don't think that means that we should americanize people's palates or expect that we should take the american burger and make it dominant and prevalent around the world there are so many rich uh tastes and cultures and food uh throughout not just asia but every i mean take singapore for example how many different cultures are there just in singapore alone with so many different you walk into a food center in singapore and you've got you know japanese beside thai beside malay beside chinese beside you know so many different flavors and cultures and and tastes and spices um and recognizing the rich variety of foods in asia is is a an entrepreneur and a, especially a plant based entrepreneur's heaven you know they have the ability to create incredible foods to make them relevant for consumers across um all of the different cultures across all of the different countries and um I'm I I love seeing the innovation that's coming through I I I was sort of amused that you guys put put out um you know Nestle and um Unilever and Cargill and so on as examples of innovation in the plant-based category those guys have been following the entrepreneurs for years they I, they wouldn't know innovation has fit them in the rear end um omnipork is do omnipork is doing some amazing things um uh genmi is doing amazing things but i'm really excited to see all of the innovation that the entrepreneurs supported by agfunder supported by gfi and big idea ventures all the things they're going to bring to to market to reflect the diversity of taste and deliciousness in in asia it's terrific andrew thanks very much uh Well, uh, Salami, one of you like to go next? I can go into Asher. This is one of my favorite topic about localization because this is something that we have emphasized to especially international brands all the time. 
it's all about building familiarity into the plant-based meat. Because uh, as Andrew mentioned, I'm, I'm totally agree. It's it, it's actually like the the bleeding, like the plant-based burger. It's it's dominate. I mean, it becomes very hot, like in the um, in the U.S. market, in the Western market. But it's very difficult for for like to pick up one single like well-established food item or meal context in China, just like a plant-based burger. So it's more about uh, because this country has sophisticated and fragmented culinary landscape, it's, it's more about how to identify the most promising examples of plant-based meat products that fit like traditional Chinese dishes and consumed by mainstream diners. So here, like I have several like key words and also like kind of a logic how to bring how to brainstorm and come up with this um, like uh, products like consumed by mainstream diners. A is about how to uh, like look at the the landscape in China. And we pick up the top two, like um, the most popular food, like because GFIC actually just published a, Ch a China plant-based meat innovation insight report back to April. And we pick up four, the most promising example of localization and the look at the, the market share in the landscape. The top two actually are hot pot and a Chinese style barbecue. And also hot pot now became one of the most popular plant-based meat application among the brands. A lot of brands try to break into the hot pot market because it's just very lucrative. But of course, we have seen a lot of effort, but for Chinese consumers, especially mainstream consumers, and also they, they quite like picky and they have very high expectation when it comes to those very popular and familiar food. So that actually urged plant-based meat brands and companies try much harder to mimic the texture and taste of the products and can win over the consumer. And the last two application and examples I want to give here, A is the snacks and B is prepared food. Because when we talk about snack, it's actually try to align with the entire snacking trend uh, globally. Because people try to think about and try to try some food conveniently, not just not just you know have to be a meal have to be a dinner breakfast or lunch they can try every time and they can just try on the go so snack became one of the very popular application and uh, uh, plant-based meat product uh in the uh in in this country so a lot of uh, a lot i know a lot of uh, international companies uh like cardio and they also try uh try to break into the snack industry and the last one is about prepared foods. Uh, actually, we have seen quite a few international companies uh, when they bring into the market, like uh, what we have mentioned before, like food service is quite dominating the entire distribution channels. But the one another very popular product along the food service and they try to launch in the uh, retail channels is prepared foods. So what are prepared foods? They are ready to eat, ready to cook, ready to heat products. So it's quite easy for consumers. They, they don't need to cook themselves because also we were uh, like companies and brands, they worry about they're going to uh, jeopardize or they, they're going to ruin the taste of the plant-based meat because if, if they don't cook properly. So if there is prepared foods, they can just put in the micro oven and they can just have the very uh, fresh plant-based meat in, already in the uh, dish. So it's a very good way for consumers to try and to understand what is plant-based meat. So prepared foods also become one of very popular products and also localization examples in China. Yeah. No. So this That's is Viola. And Slami, would you like to just round us off on that one? Right. Uh, I think I would uh, I would echo what uh, Andrew and Viola have said. And we've also been looking at, uh, you know, what uh, Zen Meat and what Omnipork have been doing. And they've really been bringing really interesting products to the market, uh, like the crayfish product, uh, which Andrew mentioned, which uh, and even Zen Meat has been partnering with other local Chinese manufacturers to differentiate their products on the basis of taste and flavor um, and 
Omnipoc has also been doing some interesting things like, uh, you know, tapping into not just the plant based trend, but also tapping into this need for nostalgic products through products like their luncheon meat. So we've been seeing some really interesting uh, innovation there as well. So um, I would say that uh, more power to you, Andrew, uh, you know, to fuel some of that innovation. <laughs> Thanks very much, Salami. Um, now, I'd just like to sort of throw open any questions from the live audience here. Yes, Lisa. Thank you very much for everyone's expertise in sharing that. Um, the trend that we see here in this marketplace is a concurrency of both um, bovine and vegan processing. So across our largest processes, which traditionally have been um, bovine processing and now running concurrent vegan lines, I'm just interested to see whether that's having any transaction in the Asian and China marketplace. So basically, Lisa, whether the factories, whether there's dedicated plant-based factories or whether they're just simply going yeah, to the, the into the, the yeah, or whether they're just going into standard meat plants. Any thoughts there, anyone? I, I so I know what's the, uh, happening. Uh, oh, sorry. I was going to say, ahead. I know what's happening from a contract manufacturing perspective um, in North America and uh, Singapore and Europe, um, effectively, the plant-based production is occurring um, in non-meat-based uh, facilities. So, what, what, uh, in terms of, for example, plant-based meat, um, the the processes are quite similar to uh, traditional meat processing, obviously without the, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the actual dispatching of the animal and so on at the beginning of the process. Uh, but in terms of the sort of, um, you, know, the, you know, the mixing, the preparation, the mincing, et cetera, some quite similar processes occur. But um, every facility I'm aware of is completely separate from meat production. Um, it's not necessarily separate from other food production. So, for example, um, you know, other recipe based uh, 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 contract manufacturing and production. But I, I haven't seen any meat comp meat factories being used as a dual purpose for both plant based and traditional meat production. The contamination would be would make that near impossible, uh, I would imagine. It, does that answer the question? I hope it does. Yeah, I, I think it does. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. That's interesting comments because, as I said, we've got very large players here doing that with uh, a level of success right now mm. without a concern of contamination across our domestic consumers. But, no, I really appreciate your global mm. viewpoint on that. Thanks. Well, Lewis, have you got any, any comments on that? If not, I'll, I've got a question here from the online people. Uh, well, we've got a question here from online. Is Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just have one comment just to add on what uh, Andrew brought up. Actually, in China, we know like home manufacturing is still very popular since a lot of brands and uh, especially startup, they don't really uh, have the ability to have their own factory. So uh, it's it also uh, the co manufacturer, uh, one of very uh, like a particular and very uh, unique thing in China is some. Uh, traditional mock meat manufacturers can also be the co-manufacturers of plant-based meat. So this is very unique in China because uh, actually, as I mentioned, mock meat is deep in the Chinese people's dining history. So they have quite mature facilities to like produce mock meat, but definitely plan, uh, plan more than plant-based meat. We call plant-based meat 2.0. They have the bad, uh, better texture and test. So definitely need to modify the, the old traditional mock meat facilities. And some uh, startup actually try to collaborate with meat producer, try to utilize, uh, utilize their uh, facility, but it's just uh, case by case, not very common in the entire market. And beside that, I know startup trying to build their own facility and factory, especially uh, after one year, uh, after uh, last year is uh, the booming year for plant-based meat and they got in, uh, some of them got investment. So this is a plan for uh, quite a few startups. Yep, that's all. Okay, thanks, Viola. And the, the online question is around regulation in the Asian market particularly with the uh, GMO products. And I'm thinking they're probably like the Impossible Foods where they have their heme product, which is made from genetically modified yeast. 
what's the what's the regulations around if it's um, aware of them for alternative protein production in Asia and China in particular? So has anyone got to know what the regulation? My, my understanding is that um, genetically modified products, particularly if you look at cell-based, is probably going to be regulated under some of the existing China Chinese novel um, products regulations, but there's no, no one's actually got any regulations specifically around a lot of these products. Would that be reasonable? Um, yeah, uh, if Salami and Andrew are not going to answer this question, yes, I can take this one. Uh, actually, uh, we, we all know like uh, impossible uh, are facing this issue in China when they try to break into the China market because uh, the gene uh, like, mod like GMO products, but actually, but there are also two methods, not just uh, genetic modification, but also gene editing, because this is also a lot of companies use gene editing in their uh, production process. It's not necessarily in the end product, but whenever companies use gene editing or gene modification in the production process, they have to get regulatory approval when they try to break into the China market. And this is a very long and rigid process in China. So we know Impossible try to try to get the approval actually since uh, one or two years ago, like when we saw the press release, you know, uh, online. But actually it took them uh, so long, but we haven't heard any updates from their side, also from the market side. So we know it's not an e easy process. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, there's uh, actually, it, it's not there is no regulation, uh, regulation, but it's it's just a very uh, long process and a lot of tests. And, uh, you know, it, sometimes it takes several years to do the test. So it's not an easy process for any uh, companies who try to use gene editing or modification in their process. So what we know is a lot of companies try to uh, found another approach to break into this market. For example, we know precision fermentation is using gene editing or modification in their process. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why they cannot get into the China market. But some of them try to get rid of this is like gene editing or modification process and try to just use biomass fermentation method to get into the market first and then they will uh, kind of like watch other companies applying for this approval and try to learn from this ex experience. This is what we know from some uh, examples. But there's no successful case that any company using this method have got um, like regulatory approval. So this is uh, the status in China. Yeah. No, I think it's been the case just, with you. Um, if you, if you wait, wait, wait. So, oh, sorry, go ahead, Andrew. No, after you, please. No, no, I was just going to say that's the story that we've heard in a few webinars that we've had with the ACBC is how convoluted the regulations can be in getting products into the China market. So the only, the only other thing I was going to say, you mentioned uh, cell-based uh, being, well, you mentioned cell-based as part of the question as it relates to genetically modified. Um, cell-based is not necessarily GMO. Uh, so I'm just making sure we're sort of calling that out. Um, cell base basically means replicating the cells of, uh, you know, replicating meat cells using a, 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 a liquid that makes those cells duplicate. Um, you're not necessarily modifying the, the genetics of the, the cells themselves. So although cell base isn't seen as very natural because it's not grown on a skeleton and involves slaughter, um, it's, it's not genetically modified unless the creators of the cells, uh, of the cell base meat actually try to modify the, the cells in some way uh, uh, at a genetic level. I hope that, I'm just making sure we're not sort of confusing GMO and cell base just because they're both kind of manipulation or, or just because they're both changes doesn't mean that cell based is GMO. If that, t t am I kind of making myself yep. clear? Absolutely. And no, no, absolutely clear, Andrew. That's, that's very much the case. Thanks. Um, got time probably Sorry for one more question from the floor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, 
question. My question uh, goes to uh, two questions. One, uh, the first one goes to Andrew. Uh, I think you are an uh, investor in this, this sector, right? So uh, my question is that uh, are you aware of um, any uh, like IP uh, uh, registrations globally and in terms of the, uh, uh, while, while we talk about localizing, you know, like uh, this uh, plant based food, any uh, uh, IP status uh, registering for the China area? So the first question, Andrew, if you didn't quite catch that, is um, has anybody got any IP protection around plant-based products in Asia, yeah, in China in particular? And, yeah, yeah. So are, are there any companies, for example, that I'm aware of who have, have been able to create um, patents or a similar form of IP protection around plant-based in particular? Yes, uh, either globally is, or in China in particular. Um, I'm not aware of, of, of which companies have filed for IP uh, rights in plant-based in China. Uh, I, I actually don't have any visibility into that at all. Um, yeah, uh, uh, apologies. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so my, my second question goes to um, Viola. Uh, I'm not sure that the, uh, whether we talk about the channels, uh, we talk about the, the wide line and all the, the takeaway, because it's such a big um, volume-based business that the, that everyone, you know, that, you know like, uh, in the greater China, they, they all, you know, like uh, every day there's a, literally hundreds of millions of uh, takeaway um, to, the, uh, you know, to the young workers mm. everywhere, and then I think one of the biggest Concern is that the, um, the, the healthiness of, of the, the takeaway, you know, like all this greasy, uh, fat based or meat based, have a very cheap food. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the question is basically around uh, in the China market, there are so many um, home delivery takeaways that are being sent out to the marketplace to people in their, in their homes, at their places of work. Um, what's the feeling around plant based meats through that channel? Um, actually, it's a very good question because I mentioned prepared foods when I mentioned about product localization examples and a uh, takeaway or home delivery is one of the uh, option. But uh, since, you know, plant-based meat actually require quite high, uh, like cooking, like cooking method, like you need to have special like cooking uh, method to prepare the food and maximize the taste and texture of the plant-based meat. So home delivery, the problem with home delivery and takeaway is it takes time to deliver to diners home or when wherever like their office or probably wherever they are, they made an order. So this is something that I know companies try to uh, like deal with, uh, make sure the the taste and texture still good after let's say half an hour delivery time and the, the consumers can still have the best experience of eating that plant-based meat. Uh, I know few companies are trying, but uh, I haven't seen this became one of the, one of the uh, popular uh, distribution channel or products in China. Uh, and sorry, actually, I want to have, I have one comment regarding the IP production uh, question. We know, uh, I'm not so sure about international companies, but um, uh, I know a lot of uh, Chinese like home grow startups, they have their own IP and they filed their own patents. So this is something uh, common in China. So I believe uh, international companies, when they break into the market, like uh, they also considering a uh, patent on the IP production. Yeah, so this is uh, actually common. Chinese yeah. Uh, so, so, um, I think we're going to have to call it. Sorry, we're going to have to call oh. that one quits. Quits there on that one. We we come towards the end of the um, of our of our time of the webinar. So I just want to say, join me in saying thank you very much for the panelists for all the time. People from all over the world have come to talk to us today, and just please show your appreciation for the panelists. And if I can just wrap up by saying, I think that we can see that the China market has many things in common with other markets in the world, 
but many things, as always, in the China market, which are unique to them and unique things that we need to consider when we're looking at the, the plant-based market. And actually, I will just ask a 30, if I'm getting 30 seconds from the, each of the um, panellists, starting with, uh, start with Viola, um, what's the opportunity for Australia in the China market? Yeah, actually, um, I think uh, I know a lot of Australian company uh, like have very great solution when it comes to novel ingredients and the formulation. And uh, actually, I think this is one of the very particular um, opportunity and also white space in the plan, entire plant based meat value chain in China. Because um, and also Salami has mentioned about clean label, and I want to echo, echo that point because Chinese consumers top culinary concern, as I mentioned, is food safety, and also they they ver they actively care and try to avoid heavily processed food with a very long ingredient list. So that's where the clean label. Pain. And particularly, they very care about how much, like, uh, how many food additives they eat in their plant-based meat. So this is something I think very uh, lucrative market for the nutrition, uh, like, uh, formulation and Nova ingredients companies try to come up with healthy and natural solutions for plant-based meat products and brands in China. And actually, I have talked to local and homegrown and plant startups and like, you know, plant-based meat brands. They all open to have more healthy and clean label solution when it comes to uh, like ingredients and the formulation. So, uh, if any Australia company you are doing like this kind of solution, like please come to China market. And of course, you can uh, chat <laughs> with me as well. Yeah. Thanks, Viola. That's great. And Salome? I, uh, I think uh, uh, I essentially uh, was going to make the same point that, uh, you know, there really is a white space, a very interesting uh, need in the China market for, for products which have plant based products which have less additives in which align with, uh, you know, uh, clean eating and, uh, you know, fewer preservatives. So that is a really important driver that we see sort of inspiring consumers to try products in this space. So uh, that is definitely, it presents a very interesting opportunity. And then uh, finally, I'd also like to add the point that we made about localization. So I think localization for a, uh, for a uh, company to sort of succeed in China in the plant-based space, I think localization is key on a multi on a few different axes. So not just localization of format, uh, but also localization of texture and taste. So I think uh, that will also be really key to uh, to succeed in this market. Thanks. And Andrew, last Andrew, what I'm going to ask you is: if someone in a family company or someone online's got a couple of million, a hundred million to put into big idea ventures, I mean, is that the best way that Australians can get involved in the marketplace? <laughs> Uh, I think there's many ways. Uh, certainly, they could give give us a big check, and we could help them invest it. But um, <laughs> we are, you know, I, I I I love I love entrepreneurs, and I think if you guys, you know, let me give you a couple of examples. How can Australia like benefit from this? This I mentioned this tsunami of of change and taste in the food industry. One is a, an Australian company called Magic Valley. Magic Valley is is a cell based company in Australia focused on lamb. Lamb has been a traditional uh, good quality food product. Uh, Australia has taken around the world. Now you can do it using cell based technology and you can be the leading lamb manufacturers of the world using cell based technology. I think that would be a great way for Australia to move forward. The other thing, the other is a company called Fen foods f-e-n-n -N foods who are also australian based and are creating an amazing array of plant-based food products there in woolworths and other places so you know start start at home you've got some great entrepreneurs give them a lot of support give them a lot of love and help take them to china so they can take uh, they can wave the australia food flag high in the in the chinese market great andrew thanks very much for the say it's um Opportunities there for Australia, as we say again, the China market 
lots of similarities, but lots of things that need to be done if you're going to be successful there. And what I might just do is I'll hand over to Elizabeth, our CEO of ACBC Queensland, just to close out our webinar. Thank you, Tony. Awesome. Great job. Oh, Thanks, Tony. Sorry, um, I'll move the um, vote of thanks rather than uh, Liz, but I just wanted to say um, <clears throat> an incredible moment to get um, speakers from, uh, I think, Hong Kong, New York and Singapore together with us here in Brisbane for such an important topic. Um, the bad news for people here in Brisbane is, as, as we were talking, it's just been announced that we're going into a three-day lockdown from 6 p.m. So anyway, sorry to break that to you. Um, so I chair the um, Food and Agribusiness Committee for Working Committee for ACBC Queensland. And um, I'm really proud that uh, Tony and Liz have been able to put this event uh, together today. It's, it's very topical. Um, and they have assembled really best-in-class speakers. I think we're very privileged to have you all today um, speaking. I learned a lot. I always do at committee meetings. Tony, uh, I come from a, I'm a lawyer by trade, uh, but I act for beef producers and um, primary producers predominantly, and I'm always fascinated to hear about this space. I don't know it as well as I should, and so... Um, it opens my mind uh, incredibly when I hear speakers like we've had today uh, tell us about what's happening. So Andrew talked about a tsunami of change coming in the food industry. Uh, even for someone who is not um, in this space, I can see that that's so, so evident. Um, Viola talked interestingly about snack being a very popular application for plant-based um, meat. So I'll be looking to spend some investment dollars in uh, plant-based snacks. That seems like a no-brainer to me. And Salome talked about um, China turning novelty product into part of the diet. Uh, and they, you know, the, our speakers talked about many things, but they were three of the things that I picked up that are very interesting. Um, so once again, thank you very much to all three of you from New York, Singapore and Hong Kong, we really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you for giving up your time. Um, enjoy where you are. We're going into our lockdown now and we'll probably try and eat some plant-based protein while we're at it. So <laughs> once again, thanks very much.